All right, it's called Leprechaun. Also, I don't have my hard copy of my book yet. I think it's coming soon. So I'm just gonna be reading off my galley on my computer. Okay. <clears throat> Leprechaun. She was meeting her new friend, Allie, for a drink, hoping if nothing else that there would be an attractive man or two to glance at appreciatively. Instead, at the other end of the nearly vacant bar sat a man she knew from another life, looking an awful lot like a leprechaun with his orange beard and luminous teal t-shirt. He came over to say hello, give her a hug, ask her how she'd been. His bloodshot eyes were disconcerting. How old is your kid these days, she asked. Later, as she tried to feign interest in the words spilling from Allie's lips, she caught him staring at her from across the bar. What? She mouthed back. He shook his head, nothing. The night wore on as she drank one beer, then another, the cloudy bissel substance making her head swirl and her vision hazy. Let me buy you a drink, he said. All vodka and Kahlua and ice, it was undrinkable. She asked the bartender to dump it out while he was in the restroom. You're hanging out with me later, he said. Only if you'll play for me, she replied, ordering another substance before following the leprechaun outside for a smoke. She laughed when she saw the pack of American spirits, remembering other nights like this one. I've always loved you, he said. I did then and I do now. Around the corner, she kissed Allie goodbye, a sloppy wet kiss on the lips that left her holding the brick wall for balance, closing her eyes while she waited for the world to right itself again. She was grateful for the chill in the air which cooled her burning face. Letting the leprechaun lead the way, she followed him down the darkened sidewalks. She took his hand and slipped the ring off his finger, not wanting to look at it. He led her through the unlocked doors of Merrill Hall up the stairs to a room with rigid reception area sofas and a piano. While he played, she thought of how enthralled she had been with him at 16, recalling the memory of curling up next to him in a sleeping bag on the porch of that camp in industry, looking up at the stars in wonder. She marveled how five years could change everything, could make someone who was once everything to you nothing, less than nothing. As she watched his torso hunch over the keys, his fingers working some unknown wasted magic, he felt to her like a ghost, liable to vanish without warning. Part of her wished he would. Another part moved forward, pressed her body against his back, and kissed the length of his neck wanting to make him real. He wanted to take her there in the room, but she insisted they go back to her place instead. So the leprechaun drove her through deserted streets and the night blurred by with the fast moving light of lampposts through the car's windows. In the morning, she found his socks on the floor, the only evidence aside from his lingering smell that he'd been there at all. She wasn't sure what to do with them wash them, burn them, throw them away, or leave them untouched in the corner. So that's the end of that one. All right. Um, like, bear with me while I scroll. All right. Um, this is a poem called uh, L'Amour at the Vogue, which is French for love is blind. Are you still awake? I'm so cold, my bones are so cold, I think I'm freezing to death. He groans and shifts across the room, please come cuddle me. He sighs but crawls into my bed, presses his stubble like needles into my neck. His, hands, his hand rubs my cold, naked shoulder, smells of cigarettes. You are cold, he says, I know, and naked, I know. In another country, playing on another loop of time, a boy named Adrian tells me l'amour est the vogue. I take a drink, fellow truche, je ne comprends pas. His eyes are like orbs of bright sea. La pauvre américaine. I reach across the table, thrust my hand through his sternum as though it were warm, camel bear, wrap my hand around his hot 
pumping mass of a heart and squeeze until it squishes through my fingers like Play-Doh and his blood begins from his mouth in a perfect stream like Lavinia in her white dress. I look into his deadening eyes and say, tant pis, you'll never know how much I could have loved you. And then I let go when his torso slumps forward into the bedroom where the other boy's stubble presses into the tender folds of my body. Um, okay, I'm gonna read this, um, sh another short piece of fiction. This one's called 97 Gulf. David had bought a forest green 1997 Volkswagen Golf off Craigslist. Marnie found it hideous, but David thought it was a gem. He wanted to teach Marnie how to drive it, but she was terrified. She didn't know how to drive a regular car, let alone a stick shift. It's so easy, Marnie, you'll see. David tried to reason with her. I told you already, I don't want to. What if you and the baby need to go somewhere while I'm at work? You'll have to learn how to drive eventually. Marnie touched her belly. At three months, she wasn't yet starting to show. Well, eventually isn't right now. The car had a funny smell. After more than an hour at a time of being cooped up inside it with all the windows rolled up, she would start to feel lightheaded. She tried rolling her window up and down to air it out, but this only irritated David. Marnie, please, we're on the highway. You're getting dust in the car. I can't breathe, she moaned. Do you want to stop for a minute to get some air, he asked. No, we just stopped. I want to get where we're going already. Then please stop playing with the window. Marnie sighed and rolled it up. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw David's fingers hover over the window lock button, but he didn't press it. Marnie had pitched a fit the last and only time David had locked the windows on her. They had been on a particularly, <clears throat> particularly long stretch through Kentucky. Marnie couldn't sleep in the car and kept badgering him to stop, but he'd insisted on driving just a little bit longer. So she started rolling the window up and down to annoy him. When he locked it on her, she had a real temper tantrum meltdown, the kind you would expect to see from a two-year-old, not an almost 17-year-old. It was how she and her mother communicated with one another in vicious, blood-curdling screams. She had never talked to David that way before. He had been different with her since that day, more careful. She worried that she had ruined it, made him realize this was all a big mistake. He should have driven her straight to the clinic and had their little parasite sucked clean out. That's what Marnie called it sometimes when she was angry with David, even though she was the one who had insisted on keeping it. She would rub her belly and whisper so only she could hear, how's my little parasite doing in there? She had been afraid at first that he was going to turn around and bring her back to the trailer she used to live in with her mother. She had apologized profusely, blamed the stress and the hormones. He said it was fine, that he understood, but he hadn't touched her the same way since. If he rested a hand on her knee while they were driving in the car, it was tentative, too gentle, as though he wasn't letting its full weight rest on her, just floating it there, ready to snatch it back if she erupted again. They were driving through the Chihuahuan Desert of Western Texas now. It didn't look like what Marnie thought a desert was supposed to look like, with smooth sloping dunes of sand as far as the eye can see. This desert was far less romantic than what Marnie had pictured in her head, with its hard flatness and all the ugly yellow and gray plants cropping up out of the ground. It did, however, as Marnie had presumed, feel as though once you entered, you were never going to make it out alive. Maybe that had been David's plan all along, to drive her out to the middle of nowhere and dump her body where no one would ever find it, start his new life fresh without any baggage from the old one dragging him down. The more Mar Marnie thought about it, the more it made perfect sense. David could never have stayed in Ohio. Someone would have found them out eventually, with or without the baby, and she was too much of a liability to be left behind. David squeezed her knee. She turned her head to look at him and he flashed her a wide smile, the way he used to, before everything got so complicated. He'd started growing a beard since they'd been on the road. 
He had more silver hairs than was typical for a man his age, and they glinted in the bright Texas sun. Marnie's belly did a little flip. You know I love you, don't you, Marnie? David asked. <sighs> Thank you, Pat. Um, okay, this is a poem. It's called Air. Air is the source from which all else comes alive, like the yeast foaming and rising and bubbling in the warm water and molasses, that sweet dark syrup sticky like sex on your skin. When the twin loaves come steaming out of the oven, you think of Christ and say, take eat, this is my body, presenting the bread still warm from the oven to the apparition before you and he takes with his hands and his mouth hungry, groping and gnawing and it feels so good, even the guilt to be devoured. Like the yeast foaming and rising and bubbling, take, eat, this is my body, bubbling in the warm, wanting only to be consumed, dripping sweet dark molasses and the apparition is nearly solid as he tells you how good your bread tastes and you thank him with regret that he isn't real that tomorrow your fingers will grope for him in the early dawn when the birds are singing sweetly to one another outside your window through condensation hung in a half moon and they will close into fists around nothing but air You've left me breathless. You've left me breathless. Um, Summer, what do you think? Should I read like maybe just a couple more poems or? Yeah, I think that's fine. I think whatever you want to do is up to you. So there's no there's no time limit, max or min. So whatever you're comfortable with. I don't I don't want to bore people too long. <laughs> oh my god. Beautiful poetry. Thank you. Um all right um this one's called another poem um desiree it is edith singing je ne regret rien and la vie en rose after sex in the midsummer heat of your apartment above the garage in the valley playing scrabble and a bottle of prosecco wearing nothing but your t-shirt it is bubbles tingling on my lips and tongue and the inside of my cheeks. The way you shake your head when you look at me and close your eyes and breathe in when I touch your skin with the tips of my fingers. It is a cold walk home in late September. It is all the words I want to say but can't. It is the chickadee on the other side of the window flitting from branch to branch in the pale morning sun. All right, um, this one's called Residue. Her mind buzzes bzz, 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 like a bumblebee can't sleep. She gives me a silver feather carved ring and tells me to love myself at the bar. We drown our self-hatred in beer and curly fries coat our insides with a thick greasy residue. She tells me her ex-husband abused her how she thinks about killing herself because my cousin won't return her calls two years for nothing. She snaps me pictures of her puffy face. He tells me he's tired of chasing her over bagels with his mother at Java Joe's. I sip my creamy cold brew and listen, scrape the excess cream cheese off my pumpernickel bagel. Um, I meant, I meant to unmute. I meant to say Java Joe's. <laughs> Pumpernickel bagel from Java Joe's. I love these local references. Yeah. <laughs> You'd never know where I lived. <laughs> um, let's see. All right. Um, this one's called My Grandfather's Hand. My grandfather's hand is cold with death, 
When I returned to his hospital room from dinner, I ordered La Vie en Rose, a gin cocktail, not the song by Edith Piaf or the sentiment expressed in the words to see life through rose-colored glasses, which could not have been less applicable, but I find Edith comforting her voice nasally but beautiful, and I think of her as I sip my rose-colored drink with the stacked square-shaped ice cubes that hit my face every time I take a sip. My grandfather is gurgling. He cannot swallow the spit building in the back of his throat, which they suction up periodically when I am absent from the room. I keep coming back to kiss his face as I am trying to leave, afraid none of the previous kisses were good enough to be the last. <sighs> okay, um, this poem is um, Greek for to boil out. Um, so part one, your pain organ bubbles to the surface. You bleed bewildered from the inside. When you sweep the floor full of steroids and antihistamines, someone told you it was anger. The kind you swallow, it has to come out somehow. Beautiful body, you see the world differently now. More ghosts than person to be invisible. Wait to find the red rash spread across your face. Your heart beats like a hummingbird's. There is a night that will always haunt you. Seeps clear fluid to the emergency room. Helpless with drugs in a cold room wearing while a nurse pricks you. Your mother touches your arm. You think it's unfair this life. Some days to take a knife clean from your bones how lovely two blotchy red patches you claw them when you think no one is watching your body's ability to burn how you shed grayish white flakes accumulate they want to pump you but these are only band-aids let grow inside you the loss of your soft the place you once called home with a thick kind of bitterness what you wouldn't give the first time you don't eat for three days you feel impossibly light when your face swells your roommates drive you sit next to you as the nurse injects you paper shirt open in the back with allergens you want to tell her to fuck off this malfunctioning body you've been trapped in you are ready to strip the flesh how satisfying it would be I think that's the last one. and